Hello everyone, this is William Armstrong with part two from part one about the Omegle shutdown. Note that Moist Critical has co also covered this where Omegle has also shut down indefinitely. He's covered it. But this is very lengthy. This is too long to read, but I'm going to try to read it all, but not all of it. I'll read some excerpts out of this. It says, your dear strangers, from the moment I discovered the internet at a young age, it's been a magical place to me. Growing up in a small town, relatively isolated from the larger world, it was a revelation how much more there was to recover or to discover how many interesting people and ideas the world had to offer. <clears throat> As a young teenager, I couldn't just waltz onto a college campus and tell a student, let's debate moral philosophy. I couldn't walk up to a professor and say, tell me something interesting about microeconomics. But online, I was able to meet those people and I had those conversations. I was also an avid Wikipedia editor. I contributed to open source software projects and I often helped answer computer programming questions posed by people many years older than me. In short, the internet opened the door to a much larger, more diverse, and more vibrant world than I would have otherwise have been able to experience and enabled me to be an active participant in and a contributor to, but to that world. All of this helped me to learn and to grow in a more well-rounded person. Moreover, as a survivor of blank blank, I was acutely aware that any time I interact with someone in the physical world, I was risking my physical body. The internet gave me a refugee from that cheer. I was under no illusion that only good people use the internet, but I knew that if I said no to someone online, they couldn't physically reach through the screen and hold a weapon to my head or worse. I saw the miles of copper wires and fiber optic cables between me and other people as a kind of shield, one that empowered me to be less isolated than my trauma and fear would have otherwise allowed. I'll read almost all of it, but not too much of it. I launched Omega when I was 18 years old and still living with my parents. It was meant to build on the things I loved about the internet while introducing a form of social spontaneity that I felt that didn't exist elsewhere. If the internet is a manifestation of the global village, Omega was meant to be a way of strolling down a street in that village, striking up conversations with people that you ran into along the way. The premise was rather straightforward. When you use Omega, it would randomly place you in a chat with someone else. These chats could be as long as or as short as you choose. If you didn't want to talk to a particular person for whatever reason, you could simply end the chat and, if desired, move on to another chat with someone else. It was the idea of meeting new people distilled down to almost its platonic ideal. <clears throat> Building on what I saw as the intrinsic safety benefits of the internet, users were anonymous to each other by default. This made chats more self-contained and made it less likely that a malicious person would be able to track someone else down off-site after their chat ended. I didn't really know what to expect when I launched Omegle. Would anyone even care about some website that an 18-year-old kid made in his bedroom in his parents' house in Vermont with without no marketing budget. But it became popular almost instantly after launch it grew organically from there, reaching millions of daily users. I believe this had something to do with meeting new people being a basic human need and with Omega being among the best ways to fulfill that need. And then as the saying goes, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will, will beat a path to your door. Over the years, people have used Omega to explore foreign cultures to get advice about their lives from impartial third parties and to help alleviate feelings of loneliness and isolation. I've even heard stories of soulmates meeting on Omega and getting married. Those only are some of the highlights. Unfortunately, there's also lowlights. Virtually every tool that can be used for good or for evil, which Leif K. Brooks is correct about that. And that is especially true of communication tools due to their innate flexibility. The telephone can be used to wish your grandmother a happy birthday, but can also be used to call in a bomb threat. There can all be no honest accounting of Omegle without acknowledging that some people misuse it, including to commit unspeakably heinous crimes. I'm doing this sort of wavy web surf style. I believe in a responsibility to be a good Samaritan and to implement reasonable measures to fight crime and other misuse. This is exactly what Amigo did. In addition to the basic safety feature of anonymity, there was a great deal of moderation behind the scenes, including a state-of-the-art AI operating in concert with a wonderful team of human moderators. Omegle punched above its weight in, con in content moderation, and I'm proud of what we've accomplished. 
Omegle's moderations had even had a positive impact beyond the site. Omegle worked with law enforcement agencies in the in the NC the NCMEC to help put evildoers in prison where they belong. There are people rotting behind bars right now, thanks in part to the evidence that Omegle proactively collected against them and tipped the authorities off to. All that said, the fight against crime isn't one that can ever truly be won. Can be won. It's a never-ending battle that must be shot and reshot every day. And even if you do the very best job, it is possible for you to do. For possible for you to do. You may make a sizable dent, but you won't win any in absolute any sense of that word. That is heartbreaking, but it's also a basic lesson of criminology, and that one I that I think the vast majority of people understand on some level. Even to superheroes, the fictional characters that our culture imbues with special powers as a form of which fulfillment in the fight against crime don't succeed at eliminating crime altogether. Hold on. In recent years, it seems like the whole world has become more honorary. Maybe that has something to do with the pandemic or, politi or with political disagreements. Whatever the reason, people have become faster to attack and slower to recognize each other's shared humanity. One aspect of this has been a constant barrage of attacks on communication services, Amigo included, based on the behavior of malicious subset of users. To an extent, it is reasonable to question the policies and practices of any place where crime has occurred. I've always welcomed constructive feedback, and indeed, Omega implemented a number of improvements based on such feedback over the years. However, the recent attacks have felt anything but constructive. The only way to please these people is to stop offering the service. Sometimes they say so explicitly and, and avowedly. Other times it can be inferred from their act of setting standards that are not humanly, humanly achievable. Either way, the net result is the same. Omegle is the direct target of these attacks, but their ultimate victim is you. All of you out there who have used or would have used Omegle to improve your lives and the lives of others, when they say Omegle shouldn't exist, they are really saying that you shouldn't be allowed to use it and that you shouldn't be allowed to meet random new people online. That idea is, is an, an anathema to the ideals of I cherish, specifically to the bedrock principle of a free society that when restrictions are imposed to prevent crime, the burden of those restrictions must not be targeted at innocent victims or potential victims of crime. Consider the ideas that society ought to face women to dress modestly in order to prevent blank. One counter-argument is that blank blankists don't really target women based on their clothing, but a more powerful counter-argument is that irrespective of what blankists do, Women's rights should remain intact. If society robs women of their rights to bodily autonomy and self-expression based on the actions of blankists, even if it does so with the best intentions in the world, then society is practically doing the work of blankists for them. Fear can be a valuable tool guiding us away from danger. However, fear can be also be a mental cage that keeps us from all the things that make life worth living. Individuals and families must be allowed to strike the right balance for themselves based on their own unique circumstances and needs. A word of a world of mandatory in mandatory fear is a world of ruled by fear, a dark place indeed. I've done my best to weather the attacks with the interests of Amigos users and the broader principle in mind. If something as simple as meeting random pe new people is forbidden, then what's next? This is that is far away and removed from anything I could or that could be considered a reasonable compromise of the principle I outlined. Analogies are a limited tool, but a physical world analogy might be shutting down a central part because crime occurs there, or perhaps more provocatively, destroying the universe because it contains evil. A healthy free society cannot endure when we are collectively afraid of each other, uh, afraid of each other to this extent. Unfortunately, what is right doesn't always prevail. As much as I wish circumstances were different, the stress and expenses of this fight coupled with the existing stress and expense of operating Omegle and fighting its misuse are simply too much. Operating Omegle is no longer sustainable financially or nor psychologically. Frankly, I don't want to have a heart attack in my 30s. The battle for Omegle has been lost, but the war against the internet rages on. Virtually every online communication service has been subject to the same kinds of attack as Omegle, and while some of them are much larger companies with much greater resources, they all have their breaking point somewhere. I worry that unless the tide turns soon, 
The internet I fell in love with may cease to exist in, it, in, it, in its place. We will have something closer to a souped-up version of TV, focused larger on passive consumption, which much less opportunity to for active participation in genuine human connection. If that sounds like a bad idea to you, please consider donating to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, an organization that fights for your rights online. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you to everyone who used Omegle for positive purposes and to everyone who contributed to the site's success in any way. I am so sorry I couldn't keep fighting for you. Sincerely, Leaf K. Brooks, founder of Omegle.com, LLC. Okay, having that said, this isn't really long, but this video is 10 minutes long. It's lengthy, but it's 10 minutes long. So, Omegle, rest, rest in paradise. I... How I found Omegle was through a friend of a friend of mine that told me about the site back in 2014, 2013, and that's how I discovered it. I found the site to be somewhat pretty good, I did, on the surface, but little did I know there was more to that than, than meets the eye. Little more to that than meets the eye. Now, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say too much, but about it about Amigo because I discovered the site had a little bit more shady stuff going on behind the scenes than intended I mean it's certain people out there that chose to use Amigo for bad purposes and there's most people out there that chose to use it for the good reasons but there are some out there who use it for the bad reasons so that's why Amigo finally shuts down in 2023 it completely shutters its doors for good all together. So this is William Armstrong signing out, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.